for everyone joining right now, uh, welcome. Thanks for being on time, uh, even early. Uh, please sit tight. We're going to wait a couple minutes for people who are in the lobby, virtual lobby, uh, to be admitted into the webinar. An important guest has just arrived. Excellent. <laughs> I'm assuming the important guest which you're, you're mentioning is Minister Tang. So welcome. We are waiting currently just for a couple minutes to give people a chance to go from the lobby and enter the webinar formally. Max, I'm going to go ahead and uh, make Ms. Tang a presenter. Thank you. As a uh, as a Hello. note for those of you. Hello. At the time. Hello. Oh. Hey. Hello and welcome, Mr. Tang. Thank, Thank you for you. being here. We we are uh, we're, waiting we're waiting currently now for uh, people to come into the lobby and then get admitted into the webinar. So um, if you we can just be patient for one one or two more minutes and then we can start our program. Please note that if you require closed captioning, it's possible that Microsoft Teams, uh, as you're, the way you are joining this particular webinar, may not necessarily provide uh, closed captioning. So uh, it's possible that the Microsoft Teams client application will be able to do that for you if you need that. This webinar, by the way, for all of you here, is being recorded. And admitting people from the lobby is a bit of a labor-intensive job, so thank you to, the, to our assistants who are doing that work. Okay. Greetings, Minister Tang. How are you? <laughs> pretty good. Pretty good. How are you doing? Excellent. Excellent. Is everything good on the tech side of things? Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, loud and clear. How about you, waiting? Are you okay? Yep, still good. Okay. Um, Hopefully, I'm no longer sharing my desktop. No, you're sharing your bookshelf. <laughs> okay. All right. That's appropriate. Yeah. I think I think you're probably good to go. I'll keep letting people in as they arrive, but I think you're you're all set. OK, all right. Thank you, Jared. Um, and uh, hello and welcome everyone to today's online event hosted here at Ohio State University. Um, my name is Max Woodworth and I'm Associate Professor of Geography at Ohio State. And I serve as the head uh, researcher and organizer in partnership with Rick Livingston of the OSU Humanities Institute for the series of events uh, tonight under the title of Asian Futures. Asian Futures is a program supported by the Ohio State Global Arts and Humanities Discovery theme 
and it funds public lectures, workshops, community events, reading groups, and curricular research into Asian studies here at Ohio State through 2022. The overarching purpose of Asian Futures is to draw greater attention to Asian studies on campus and to use our resources at OSU to bring greater awareness of the transformations afoot across Asia to broader audiences here in Ohio. With that in mind, I'm delighted to be able to welcome today as our distinguished guest, Taiwan's Digital Minister, Audrey Tang, who joins us online from Taipei, where it is now early in the morning on Tuesday. Minister Tang has a fascinating and decidedly unorthodox professional trajectory that includes her dropping out of school, cutting her teeth in the high pressure world of Silicon Valley, and then as a so-called hacktivist, pushing the Taiwanese government to embrace reforms of radical data transparency. Since 2016, she has been active first advising the government on digital affairs and has now risen to the formal role of Minister Without Portfolio. Thank you, Minister Tang, for taking the time from your busy schedule to be with us today. Good local time and good local time from the future, like literally Tuesday. Yes, yeah, very, very sci-fi. Um, I also want to uh, welcome as well here Wei Ting Yen, Assistant Professor of Government at Franklin and Marshall College in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. She joins us from Savannah, Georgia, for some reason. Uh, Dr. Yen is a specialist in political economy and politics in Taiwan and East Asia, and has written recently about Taiwan's COVID-19 management. Dr. Yen is also an Ohio State alumna, so welcome back virtually to campus, waiting. Um, the theme for today's discussion is digital democracy and COVID-19 in Taiwan. Uh, our time is short, so we have only an hour before the minister must go on with her busy day. So I will be very brief here uh, with my introductory comments so we can move to the discussion and Q&A quickly. As many of you likely know, Taiwan has seen remarkable success in its fight against COVID-19. For us here in the United States, the numbers that Taiwan has recorded are really quite outstanding. Since the outbreak of COVID-19, Taiwan has had fewer than 17,000 cases, and as of today, 848 deaths. Moreover, roughly 90% of the cases and deaths recorded occurred in May and June this year before being aggressively contained and returning to trend which is to say case numbers in the single digits with occasional peaks over that. There is an important story to tell where Taiwan's COVID-19 response is concerned. And shortly, we will ask Minister Tang about this experience and the current outlook. But Dr. Yan and I are also curious to inquire as well about Taiwan's recent innovations in what has come to be called digital democracy. Though there are several definitions for this term, we might think of digital democracy broadly as the use of information and communications technology for the purposes of enhancing political democracy and or the participation of citizens in democratic communication. We bring up digital democracy here for two reasons. First, Minister Tang has been active for many years in efforts to use digital tools for policymaking and cross-agency coordination in her work inside government and has, as mentioned, been a proponent and designer of open source software and of radical transparency. Second, digital tools have been central to the COVID-19 response in Taiwan. So we are eager here to learn about this intersection of these themes, and our questions are directed in that, in that way. So our format today is designed to be informal and conversational. Dr. Yen and I have prepared questions that we'll ask the minister, uh, that we will ask the minister, and we will make sure to reserve 20 minutes or so before the end of the hour for public questions. For those of you who have questions, please make sure to, uh, to send them through the chat function and we will be curating those questions as they come in. So um, perhaps first I will uh, yield to Dr. Yen to begin uh, and, then, um, and then I will take turns asking as well and we'll just have this be a conversation. And once again, thank you, Dr. Minister Tang for joining us. It's a real pleasure. Certainly. Okay, so I guess we'll start with um, a question about Taiwan's handling of COVID. Uh, so Taiwan has been viewed as a very successful case in handling the COVID crisis. And we know one reason behind the success is, you know, the usage of digital technology. For example, uh, Taiwan used the QR code system for contact tracing uh, process. Uh, when talking about digital tools or digital governance, people may immediately think of privacy violation or digital surveillance. And so in the U.S., there is this argument saying that the public here is more protective of their privacy and does not trust the government to collect uh, personal information. 
So a high level of digital governance can only work in Asia where people may have different expectations of privacy protection. So we're curious what are your thoughts uh, on this statement and do you think there are some prerequisite or even civic virtue needed for digital governance or digi digital, digital democracy to work? Certainly, um, and uh, I'd like to share <coughs> uh, first a application from last February uh, that does not involve any privacy trade-offs. Uh, and uh, like the QR code contact tracing, which I'll get to, um, it, it's created not by the government, but rather by the social sector. So the prerequisite is a strongly empowered social sector. Uh, in the US, I believe it's called a civic technology uh, community uh, or the voluntary sector, the charitable sector, the third sector or uh, whatever. In Taiwan, we call it the social sector. So um, there is a social sector community called G0V or Gov0 that look at all the digital services uh, that the government does, which is something GOVTW, uh, and make forks, that is to say open source autonomy alternatives uh, at G0V, the T, uh, TW. So just changing O to a zero in your browser bar gets you into this kind of shadow government uh, that tens of thousands of people on a Slack channel or Telegram or IRC are contributing at any given time. So left as February, for example, even before we instituted a mask rationing scheme, people in Gov0 made this map that lets you track your neighborhood's availability of medical grade masks. Now, uh, you see here that, for example, on this particular pharmacy, there's 58 uh, adult masks and there's close to 200 children's masks. Uh, and if it runs out of mask, well, it goes red and then finally gray, so that people queuing in line can actually reverse audit uh, the system so that they see the person queuing before them bought a few masks and after 30 seconds, uh, the phone uh, refreshes, right? So on their chatbot or map or whatever, they see that the inventory actually depletes in real time. So this first, of course, quells uh, the fear, uncertainty and doubt because you just go to the farms that still have some mask left. And second, it reveals the bias and distribution issues. Uh, for example, uh, we initially saw the population centers overlay exactly with the pharmacies, uh, but that not everyone own a helicopter as the OpenStreetMap community pointed out. So when MP Gao Hong and interpolated our Minister of Health, Chen Shu Zhong, about this unfair distribution of urban and rural areas based on this real-time data published every 30 seconds. We changed the distribution overnight uh, and Mr. Chen simply said legislator teach us. So it brings a, a previously oppositional policy or political relationship through open data in real time into a co-creative relationship and there's really is nothing privacy uh, related in this co-creation. I point this out because it's the same bunch of people in Gov0. This May uh, when we had our first and real wave, uh, which is passed so far in the past couple of months, we're essentially back to local zero cases. But during the height of that, during May, it took of zero only a couple of days to roll out this very innovative app-free contact tracing method. And again, with no privacy uh, violation by the state because it's created by the people, right? So basically the volunteers uh, posted this QR code and in your phone's lock screen without downloading any new app, you can point your camera to the QR code and it pops out a composition screen of a short message to 1922, the well-trusted uh, toll-free number for counter-epidemic work and, and you press send and that's it. So like literally uh, just, this doesn't require a tap, so a single tap and about uh, three seconds uh, and then you finish a check-in. And this has no uh, privacy violations precisely because the five telecom carriers who received this SMS isn't going to transmit it anywhere. So, and they already know your phone number anyway. And the 15 digits is only known to the venue owner and the QR code maker and not known by the telecom carrier. So through a design called multi-party security, no single piece of puzzle will reveal your whereabouts. So this is not a compromise. Rather, this is a social innovation from the social sector. And through this idea of reverse procurement, we just make sure that we secure the resource to make that happen. But it's actually co-created by very privacy-minded social sector in the first place as a viable fork of the government services, which at the time was still based on pen and paper registration. And it doesn't replace pen and paper. You can still use pen and paper if you want to. Okay, thank you. That's 
Very good answer. I think we'll come back to some of the uh, trust and digital democracy question later. Uh, but I think following the, the previous question, um, another thing that happened during the pandemic we know is that we observe not just a pandemic, we also observe an infodemic, right, with loads of misinformation circulating both online and offline. And so when tackling misinformation, uh, I know you have mentioned a lot in a lot of interviews that Taiwan uses this humor for rumor approach uh, to uh, fight against information during uh, COVID-19. However, uh, my observation is that during the latest COVID-19 wave in Taiwan back in uh, May 2021, uh, at the time, amid a very high uncertainty and panics among the citizens, the humor for rumor uh, approach seemed ineffective at, at that time. And the result was that many issues such as vaccines, you know, uh, were po uh, politicized and people started to disrupt the government. And so uh, we're interested in your opinion, what are the other ways we can use to strengthen the fight against misinformation? Yeah, definitely. And it's a really, really good question. So um, I would still say that uh, if we don't have the very cute spokes dog uh, to be with us uh, this May and June, uh, then it will actually be much worse. Uh, and just for the record, here is the cute spokes dog. So, or, or Zongchai, right? So uh, Zongchai reminds you to, for example, keep three cute dogs distance from one another indoors and two outdoors. Or Zongchai reminds you to uh, wear a mask to protect your own face against your own unwashed hands, so on and so forth. So, so, um, of course, so Zongchai is very effective and mimetic uh, so that people willingly <clears throat> share this public service announcement information and remix it to their heart's desire. And it's true that we had a vaccine appointment system uh, that initially uh, were uh, not that effective uh, in getting the people above 65 years old uh, vaccinated, which is the highest priority group. Uh, and simply because the, the memes uh, and so on <clears throat> doesn't doesn't uh, actually translate into uh, a accessible digital service the way that the uh, SMS uh, contact tracing or the uh, mask rationing is accessible for the elderly people. So for the elderly people, we didn't ask them to uh, register for vaccine appointments on the internet, except the Taipei municipality. I believe all other municipalities simply used the district chief, the Li Zhang system, as well as the local health offices and so on. Uh, and the theory is that people above 65 um, are retired, so they have more time on their hands. So it's easier instead of asking them to call to register uh, for vaccines, uh, simply appoint uh, people in a single district going into a single place uh, at some uh, given time so that uh, they may be vaccinated en masse. Uh, however, it is true that um, the primary communication channel to these elderly people were not over the internet and decidedly not mimetic. Uh, so there's a lot of rumors uh, that were circulating uh, online about the fairness and timeliness of vaccine availability. So I believe uh, we overcame that uh, through a two-pronged approach. First, when people uh, below 64 years old do actually have a fair access to a vaccine appointment system, that put an end uh, to the kind of panic on the local and uh, um, national and district level uh, on the uh, unpredictability of vaccine arrival and so on. So uh, that put predictability to it, similar to how the mask rationing map put predictability uh, to the mask rationing, which was also initially quite panic inducing and quite scarce uh, as it were last February. So we overcame that in about a month's time. And second, uh, and I, I must also thank the US and Japan for donating the vaccines in time. So when the people uh, felt the scarcity was at its peak, at its maximum, um, the US donated uh, Moderna and the Japan donated AstraZeneca uh, so that people preferring uh, those two different doses because one of the roots of the pandemic was that there were people who prefer Moderna far over AstraZeneca uh, and there's people who prefer the BNT Pfizer far uh, over <laughs> the, the Medigen, for example, our homebrew uh, and so on. But but uh, when we made sure that there's uh, plenty of supply now of all the four different brands, despite their social preferences and making the social preferences public by making the vaccine appointment system open data. So in real time, everyone can see the real time preference of the four uh, different um, labels of the vaccines in each and every uh, municipality or, 
or city uh, in the age group of five. Uh, so that if the uh, social preference as a transparent social object put an end to the speculation. Uh, this is all <clears throat> this is all extremely detailed and it's it's in incredibly interesting to follow because you know as as we as we try to grapple with COVID-19 in the United States, we, we the communications, I think, are fair. It's fair to say the communications around vaccines, around masks, has been um, maybe maybe could be described as somewhat muddled, uh, and, and certainly hasn't been uh, driven with the same kind of digital literacy that we, you seem to be comfortable promoting in Taiwan. So I, I was curious too, just in response to this, um, in your as you're talking about developing open source tools uh, and and using uh, civic tech to develop these tools, um, the, Im the implication there is uh, two th well two things. One is the uh, an extremely high degree of engagement in the population that uh, appears to be um, something that you've seen, and then and second, uh, not just engagement in an analog space, but literacy in the digital space so that people are comfortable in navigating and not just navigating and that's one thing but to develop and and to be able to code and to produce these things from scratch so I, i'm i'm curious how you how you work with civic tech groups to uh, to foster this kind of activity to produce actionable usable tools mm -hmm. <laughs> So, um, so that's really two questions, right? One is about the co-creation, and another is about the literacy and I would call it competence uh, in basic education and lifelong education. If I get you correctly, so um, yeah, these are, are all very deep questions, worthy of three hour seminars. But I will be brief. Uh, so, uh, in in short, um, the idea here is very simple: is to trust our citizens. In Taiwan, the internet and democracy began um, its roots uh, both in the late 80s, right, 87, when we lifted out of the martial law. That was the beginning of the BitNet and the local BBS culture. At the time, uh, there's still no uh, free elections. For example, our direct presidential election would come in early 96. So during the decade since 87 to 96, the social sector gained a lot of legitimacy by providing for services through local co-ops, charities, and things like that, not just a part of democratization process, but also part of our environmental protection, part of our uh, disaster recovery around the turn of century. We had a really large earthquake that mobilized pretty much all the social sector of all the faith. Uh, and to this day, if you have a earthquake uh, in, for example, Eastern Taiwan, if the local social sector publish a number uh, and the local municipality publish a number, people are going to trust the social sector sector number. So they uh, like Tsuji's number. So basically, people had uh, made a high legitimacy apparatus uh, on top of which that we bring the technology as a digital kind of assistive tool. Uh, but when we, for example, occupy the parliament uh, in 2014, uh, March, totally nonviolent in a deliberative way, half a million people on the street. The real organizers are the 20 or so NGOs, civil society organizations around the parliament uh, that took the agenda of the trade deal uh, with staging and deliberated it aspect by aspect. And again, this is something that started and defined uh, by the social sector. So a history of the social sector setting the political and social agenda, I believe, is the infrastructure and digital. It's just a way Way to amplify their connectivity. But the US also had a really strong, you know, civil liberties, uh, unions and cooperatives movement. So credit unions, for example, is an idea we took from the US and applied to Taiwan. Uh, so you probably know what I'm talking about. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is that uh, we uh, emphasize in our educational curriculum, a idea of competence, which is making contributions in real time, instead of just literacy, which is consuming information in real time. For example, all the pretty much all the primary schools uh, in Taiwan have this thing called Airbox. 
And the air box uh, is something that measures PM 2.5 levels in your vicinity. It contributes, of course, to climate science. It um, is part of a distributed ledger maintained by our National Academy, the Zhongyan Yuan, uh, that makes sure that when people, for example, want to jog outside, they can check their nearby schools and balconies uh, real-time PM 2.5 number before deciding whether to go out or, or wear a mask or something. Well, you wear a mask anyway. But uh, the point here is that the kids, they learn that data stewardship, data bias, things that cannot be taught easily, can be learned easily when you make real-time contributions to the society. Uh, and when they enter middle school, for example, in addition to the Airbox work, they are now working on media competency project that, for example, fact checks our three presidential candidates debate in real time. But it's not just a exercise. If they find something that is out of, um, you know, the, the recorded fact, uh, it actually gets amplified by the public TV network and so on during the debate in real time captions. Uh, so they also contribute to the democratic process as part of their learning in a kind of uh, capstone uh, project. And they can also start petitions. Actually, uh, more than a quarter of our nationwide petitions were started by people uh, lower than 18 years old, that is to say not having the right to vote yet. Uh, so they can say, for example, ban plastic straws from our uh, take out of our bubble teas and so on. And that actually resulted in policy change. Uh, and when we asked the, the person who started a young lady uh, just turned 17 when she raised this petition, uh, why are you starting this movement? And she's like, this is our civics class assignment. So obviously, competency <laughs> education is already part of basic education. Great. Um, it's funny you mentioned the air box because we have someone uh, here in the uh, in joining us today in the webinar, Jian Shushan. Who's a, who, who has a <laughs> who has a project, uh, and actually I work with him on this airbox project in Taiwan. So I know that one of the things that's curious about the airboxes in Taiwan is that actually the air quality is quite good, as we've discovered. Uh, yeah. Yes, definitely. Uh, but it, it's better than when it started. So the fact that people mobilized uh, parades, demonstration and so on based on airbox data actually resulted uh, in a policy change that resulted in better air quality. So it's uh, all very impactful. I think That's they great. moved to water boxes now. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm curious, too, because one of the things that um, uh, the second question I'd like to ask you, um, well, I'd like to ask you so many questions and we have so little time, but I, 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 given your, 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 your history in working with digital tools, you worked with the, the, the it's called the POLIS uh, tool that's uh, developed by a group in, in, in Seattle, uh, mm -hmm. but you've applied them on the ground in Taiwan. And, and I'm wondering if you could, for our audience here, if you could explain a little bit how that works and, and where it was applied and, and how it demonstrates and, or as an example of mm -hmm. digital democracy in action. And then maybe if you could mention some limitations as well of the certainly. So uh, here is Polis, uh, and in all its glory, uh, in 2015 when we first apply it. So it's a real conversation. You see um, that you're represented by a uh, circle, a blue skirt circle, your avatar, uh, and near you are the people who feel similar to you, your social media friends and families, around one particular subject. In 2015, that was about UberX. There were a lot of tensions at the time uh, in Taiwan because <clears throat> UberX at the time said it's a ride-sharing tool, uh, but the taxi fleet doesn't think of this way. Uh, there are some uh, people who say it's sharing economy, but some people say it's a really gig economy. Some people say it would be better for labor conditions. Some people said it would be worse. So uh, it's all very um, controversial. So uh, in 2015, we adopted this AI-powered conversation. And by AI, we mean assistive intelligence uh, that is aligned uh, with the pro-social part of the social media instead of the anti-social part of social media. Media. And it also qualifies as a digital public infrastructure because nowadays Polis is polis.gov.tw. We run our own instance here so that all the government officials can start a um, Polis conversation as easy as they can start a survey or poll or something. Because in, in a sense, it's really like a survey, but a wiki survey where the survey questions are written by the participants themselves. Instead of focusing only on solutions at the very beginning, we just focus on sharing the 
facts and let people reverberate, resonate with one another's feelings for three weeks. Now, after three weeks of co-creation, uh, eventually there will be some idea that take care of most people's feelings, which we do translate that into regulations and laws. So as a participant, it looks like this. You see a fellow citizen's uh, feeling. They feel that the uh, passenger liability insurance should be mandatory, uh, no matter uh, whether the driver is registered, at least uh, um, insurance should um, protect the person on the back seat. So if you click agree, you move uh, further uh, to this person. If you disagree, uh, you move away uh, from that person. But there's no reply button, so there's no room for troll to grow. Uh, rather, the reply button is at the bottom where uh, you can't reply directly to any sentiment, but you can propose your own sentiments uh, to gain acceptance across the aisle, across the different groups. And the numbers here are um, representative, of course, of people who agree with each other. But the area here measures plurality. That is to say, um, if you get 2,000 people here voting exactly the same way, it doesn't increase the area of any particular group. Uh, we really only hold ourselves to account on the multi-stakeholder meeting live streamed after the police uh, phase, uh, only on the things that most people agree on, on the consensus statements. So people learn very quickly uh, to not compete or waste too much calories on the ideological divisive statements, whether it's gig or sharing economy, but rather um, on the things that people do agree most of the time with most of their neighbors uh, on the most of the topics. So this, for example, would uh, entail empowering local temples and churches, the social sector, to run their own fleets, similar to Uber enjoying surge pricing, for example. Uh, about registration, about insurance, about not undercutting existing taxi meters, uh, and so on and so forth. So those consensus statements were then held as agenda for this interagency meeting with taxi and Uber and so on representatives and basically say, uh, this is the, the will of the people, so let's implement the will of the people together. So this is a way to very quickly form shared goals to collectively define measures of progress to find what's key in the KPI in a way that's very reliable. And so after quickly forming shared goals, the innovation that deliver on those goals can be delivered quickly uh, by the stakeholders. So for quite some time now, Uber is now a legal company registered in Taiwan, the Q-Taxi, the local temples and churches are in power in a similar way, everybody wins. And so this is what uh, is possible uh, with Digital democracy is to listen to each other at scale instead of just a few elites speaking to the public via broadcasting at scale. Uh, and so the agenda setting um, is police strengths. Uh, of course, uh, there is limitations. Uh, police is not that easily to be applied to things uh, that are overly abstract. So we had to translate each conversation into something, uh, to use uh, Cass Sunstein's term, uh, something of overlapping consensus, uh, meaning instead of deliberating about sharing economy in general, we just uh, talk about one specific case, someone driving to work, pick up a stranger they met on the app and charging them for it, and do the same regularly uh, when they drive back home from work. Uh, and in this very specific example, people have similar situations and experiences before, so they can relate to it. And this relatedness is what allows the resonance uh, to develop. Great. That's it, it's a really fascinating um, development that 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 seems to be employed. I, um, I I want to I want to leave some uh, for waiting if uh, waiting if you want to ask a, a question at this point. Uh, yes. I mean, like you, I <laughs> have like so many questions I can ask, but I think we only have eight minutes till. Uh, uh, we open the floor. Yes. Yeah. So I guess I will ask a more a broad questions about the potential the future of digital democracy because at this point what I've heard is that the reason why uh, COVID works or even how digital democracy works relies on two things. One is a very empowered civil society and almost like a tax savvy mm -hmm. civil society and the second thing is trust, mutual trust. Trusting the people, trusting uh, the, the trust between the government and the people and then trust between the people. Yes. And so in a lot of democracy, especially Western democracy, what we know, you know, it's a more and more polarized society. Mm -hmm. And then, then it, misinformation kind of make it even worse. So trust actually has become a very, uh, you know, rare commodity in today's public life. And so when you're talking, what I'm thinking is in a world with 
trust, lacking lack of trust and filled with more misinformation, how do we envision the 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 future of digital democracy and uh, uh, or in places when it's already polarized? What's your view of developing a more function in digital democracy? Yeah, but the lack of trust is really a symptom uh, and the root cause is the lack of investment to the public squares, the trust infrastructures, both digitally and of course in the face-to-face -face setting. Uh, in many um, areas, uh, in Taiwan certainly, but also in the US, the public parks, uh, the, the campuses, uh, the town halls and so on, were probably built in a single generation when people decided that having some baseball fields right in the community is very important. Uh, and if say if people don't make that decision, there may be a, a lack of community interaction. There will be no third space right between work and the family. Uh, and uh, people will observe that they grow more distance uh, with their neighbors. But instead of overly analyzing that, maybe we should just build more parks. In, in Taiwan, uh, since 2016, we've classified the digital public infrastructure as infrastructure. That is to say, previously, the special budget, which could only be used for a tangible concrete uh, constructions like literally made out of concrete may now be also uh, invested in the digital equivalent of the public square because we realize if we don't invest in the pro-social social spaces online, our citizens will be forced to take the democratic conversations to some place that decidedly undemocratic, namely to Facebook, which would be like holding a town hall uh, in a smoke filled room with addictive drinks and private bouncers, very loud music. You have to shout to get heard, uh, selling a lot of advertisement and things like that, right? And and it's the same sort of people. Uh, and I don't have anything against the entertainment sector. Uh, the nightclubs in Taiwan are now open, uh, but uh, we're not designating these places as spaces for democracy. And we need to do the same around the world to invest appropriately in the equivalent of the police infrastructure uh, in our joint platform, the e-petition that I briefly al alluded to, and many other ways to uh, foster the idea of co-creation online in a space that's more naturally uh, to resonate rather than to divide. Great. I, I, if I could, I, I, I was curious, and something along similar lines is that you know, I, much of the discussion, uh, so Wei Ting mentioned the polarization, um, and of course in the United States and in many other countries, there's a lot of controversy around Facebook and other social media platforms, and, uh, and a lot of questions around uh, control over algorithms and such. So I'm curious where you stand on issues of sort of open... Uh, you've described yourself as a kind of radical transparency advocate. Um, and so I'm curious where you sort of stand on the issue of algorithmic justice and uh, other issues around uh, digital e equality and equity and democracy in the, in the digital space. And especially in the context of today where uh, there seems to be a lot of instrumentalization of digital tools for very non-democratic means. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Um, there's another GovZero project, the COFAX project, that um, detects the disinformation and scams and spams and whatever uh, when you forward a message from into an encrypted channels like reporting spam, uh, it posts the most viral <coughs> disinformation at any given time. <clears throat> so that the journalists at the uh, Taiwan Fact Check Center and many other uh, in the international uh, fact checking network can focus their energy on the things that are actually trending. Uh, and I believe that the social sector should um, hold the private sector and the public sector to account. That is to say, uh, it's not the state fact-checking the companies and not the other way around, but rather a community, a voluntary community, the social sector uh, doing this uh, gatekeeping work. The GovZero people have also uh, literally uh, went into our national auditing office at the Control UN and brought out paper copies of the campaign donations and finances uh, and uh, to post them as structural data, asking people to collaborate 
relatively OCR uh, to, to uh, Otaku character recognize uh, the printed uh, filings. And it directly prompted the legislature uh, to enact a law of uh, basically transparency around campaign donations starting 2018. All the campaign donation expense are to be published uh, in open data to enable investigative journalists and of this kind that they can uh, distill the campaign donors roster and so on starting 2018 without resorting uh, to crowdsourcing. So it's like the mass rationing map adopted by the National Health Insurance uh, Administration to ensure the numbers are timely and correct. And when people analyze that, people discover uh, that the social media campaigns are not, were not disclosed here. It was not filed as campaign donations. The campaign can be only funded by domestic sources. But at the time in 2018, the funding came from the extra um, jur jurisdictional sources, right? So basically, there's a, a gaping loophole that's revealed by the social sector of zeros uh, opening up of the campaign donation roster. So uh, they then went and applied the same pressure to Facebook saying, uh, I, I don't care about the norms around the world, but in Taiwan, we just occupy the national office to, to ask for the radical transparency of the political uh, and the, the social campaigns data, right? So you need to adhere to the norm and habit that is set by the social sector, which were recently amplified by the state. So according to a internal Facebook um, ex-employee whistleblower, uh, Taiwan was one of the only jurisdictions back in 2019 that Facebook took seriously and invested in civic integrity and also disclosed in real time as open data, the advertisements uh, from the foreign uh, sponsor sources, banning them and then disclosing also from domestic sources so that the dark patterns uh, can be reviewed by GovZero investigative journalists uh, in real time. So uh, this is uh, really detailed, but the point here is that uh, we see ourselves in the state as just a amplifier of the norms in the social sector. It's just like a trade negotiation. Without passing any laws to ban Facebook or anything, we gain tremendous negotiating leverage because Facebook knows if they do not conform the way our national audit office conformed, then there will be social sanction. And there are actually a viable alternative to Facebook, like PTT or Dcard or whatever. Uh, so that's the, the threat of social sanction is real, and which is why they also conform to our local norm. Fascinating. Great. That's <clears throat> that's wonderful. Thank you so much for those incredibly detailed answers and, and sharing those slides. It's really helpful. Um, mm, sure. I'm. I, I'd like to open it up for for questions from the audience. Um, I'm looking here. Uh, if people, I, I, I'm assuming that people are able to submit questions in the chat. Um, I don't know if. Uh, or raise their John, hands. Yeah, or raise their hands. Uh, that would be great. Um, let's see here. I'm trying to find that here. Participants. I don't see hands raising. Um, for Jared or, or Sujan, uh, can either of you uh, confirm to us that people are able to submit questions? They should be. This is Sujan. Uh, they should be uh, able to submit question, uh, uh, questions via chat. The settings haven't okay. changed. Um, maybe they're just uh, right. thinking about a good question to ask. Yeah. Yeah. People are welcome to to submit one. And here we go. Uh, let's see here. We got. Ah. Hi, Jared. Did... I I just have a, a a really quick question. Hoping you can hear me okay. Whoops. Hoping you can hear yes. me okay. Um, so the I mean the question in some sense is is a follow up on the question that that Wai Ting asked earlier, which is. You know, there's so much that I listen to you talk, Minister Tang, and I think this sounds like utopia. This is the techno utopia I've been dreaming about and reading about in in my science fiction novels. But then I think about the world that um, I live in and, um, you know, the many unique challenges to, for one thing, a, a population that is as was suggested earlier, deeply distrustful of each other at this moment. Uh, but also the, you know, the, the challenge, and this comes up in a lot of speculative fiction that I read, that 
deals with questions of, of digital democracies, which is how do we handle the, the fundamental challenge of um, addressing micro democracies or the kind of unique, um, often very localized communities that have their own need, geographic, uh, you know, cultural, ethnic, and so on, that will not be reflected in a simple majority vote, for example. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is why we don't use the majority vote. Right. <laughs> we crowdsource uh, for innovations, but we do not actually vote down any particular idea, right? On the Polish screen that I just shared, the right. minority groups, if they're diverse uh, from every other group's views, that views gets not only preserved, but potentially amplified because people have to talk across aisles in order to have their feelings to resonate and be accounted for. So uh, I, I think it's all in the design of the system. If the bit rate is small, if each person only have three bits of information uploaded every four years called voting, by the way, uh, then of course we need to compress our social preferences into an impossibly flat degree. And that allows the kind of dynamic of the majority outvoting the minority. Uh, But if there are a huge number of people setting their own agenda, as we see in Polis, the bit rate is much, much higher. uh, And coupled with the real time live streamed uh, stakeholder consultations, uh, it easily uh, made sure that people feel it's symmetric, right? Uh, right? As much as they receive from the deliberative space, they can also contribute a equal amount, the uplink and the downlink are symmetrical. And this feeling of symmetry, I believe, helps people to feel empowered so that uh, they in any locality cannot just remix the innovations like the uh, contact tracing. They can uh, adopt their own QR code scanner. Uh, They can also stamp their way in into the venues. They're not bound by the centrally uh, dictated rules. And that's because the civic tech are open source. I made a point of displaying (laughs) their free software licenses. Uh, So just like my eyeglass, they're purely assistive technology. If I don't like my eyeglass, I can adjust it however I want without paying a huge amount of license fees. And of course, it doesn't pop out uh, advertisement every 20 seconds or something. It's entirely aligned to my uh, best, my interests. It's wonderful. Thank you so much. Great. We have, um, let's see. So we have some questions coming in here. Hold on one second here. Um, I'm happy to read if that's easier for you, Max. Sure, well. if you don't mind, yeah. No, no, not at all. So the, the first question um, uh, asks, so during the 2021 outbreaks in Taiwan, several public agencies needed to work from home. During that time, we also observed that digital governance for the public sector was not as well developed as we had hoped. For example, most agencies still relied on hard uh, hard, copy. hard copy, yeah, and refuse to use digital documents. Based on your experience, how can we push the public sector in Taiwan to do the kind of digital reforms needed for the next crisis? Yeah, definitely. So um, we did not have to work for home for long, right? Uh, I'm a teleworking minister, by the way. Uh, so starting 2016, uh, I only entered the cabinet office every Monday and Thursday, I believe. And the other days, I'm just touring around Taiwan on Taiwan high-speed rails and so on. Uh, And so uh, it all depends on whether uh, the minister uh, in your ministry or the if you're in a local municipality, uh, the uh, section chief or your uh, vice mayor or mayor um, prefer to see people in the same room or whether they prefer uh, to to work on a shared workspace digitally. This is really of habit. Uh, There's many people in Taiwan on the uh, entry level in the public sector that works exclusively online. But when their superiors uh, want to see the hard copies, they have to finally still print out uh, those whatever business intelligence tools that they're using and distill it to something that can be contained by paper 
so it's a, a culture of paper, it is true. Um, so there's two things uh, that we can do to address this. Uh, one is, very simply put, to get them more positive experiences. If they uh, can't switch out of pencil, uh, then at least uh, use a stylus, right? I use stylus exclusively. Uh, and so the senior officials that I work with, when you get them the stylus, they, they are then more happy to work on a tablet or something because they uh, uh, preserve their kind of thinking out loud habits. Uh, while, uh, you know, digitally annotating the documents. So bring technologies to where the people are instead of asking people to adapt to keyboards or mouse, which is really unfamiliar to the senior policy maker. The same goes for video conferencing. If you made sure that a video conference for them is just, you know, uh, sitting in this chair and start talking. Most people are actually feeling it's more uh, actually intimate than having to wear a mask in the same room. Uh, but if you ask them to set up their own uh, team's conversation and so on. Well, that's a, a, a tall ask. So uh, again, bring the technology via assistance uh, to the offices. So in Taiwan, we're, we're very maybe uniquely fortunate in the world that we don't have to digitally transform in the past couple of years. We, we, uh, our schools are, you know, in the same room, right? But some teachers are embracing the digital uh, curriculum and so on for the particularly uh, co-creative classes where people code together, design together and things like that, then they prefer a digital workspace over a analog whiteboard because it enables more input from the children. Uh, a tool called Slido is very popular because it enables children uh, to not be captured by the uh, Instagram and equivalents on their phone. They can still post, comment and like each other, uh, but on the way that's pro-social, that is actually projecting uh, to the teacher and the students can set agenda for the teachers, but it's not from their home. They are still in the same classroom for, for uh, of course, we, we've had no, you know, COVID for the majority of last year and only for a few months this year, so that we still use face-to-face -face setting, we just use digital to amplify that. This is maybe peculiar to Taiwan, but that's the state we're in. That, that's terrific and, and actually just makes me really think about how unique it is to have a, a democracy that's kind of evolving and growing up with the digital revolution. Um, and I, that kind of brings to, I think, the other question that came up on the chat, which touches on on some issues that were related earlier, related to the question of the public trust, but particularly in relationship to an issue that is, is very fraught in a lot of Western uh, countries right now, which is the question about, um, about private data this obsession or fetishization of the invasion uh, through the use of data and digital democratic tools or those that have that potential to be seen as an invasion of privacy. Um, obviously, that's not a, a significant crisis in Taiwan, but the questioner asks, how do you think a government might restore public trust with the help of a technology that many people view with certain skepticism around these issues? Yeah, as I mentioned, if this uh, eyeglass pops out advertisement or government propaganda every 20 minutes, if, if it, when it breaks, I have to pay millions of dollars to reverse engineer a schema to fix it instead of sending it to a repair person down the street, uh, then of course I wouldn't trust this glass, right? Uh, and and I, I think that is uh, really the point here in that if the government develops government technology that did not exist before the pandemic, of course it will be met with a lot of fear, uncertainty and doubt for the cybersecurity and privacy perimeters were simply unknown to the people because they didn't exist before the pandemic. And again, Taiwan is somewhat unique because we've never entered a state of emergency. All our uh, intervention, our measures must be pre-approved by the parliament in both the budget and the law required to enable it. So it means we are stuck with the already trusted building components like Legos, uh, which is why we use some decidedly low tech, but appropriate tech components like printed QR code, like manually tweeting uh, the 15 digits to 192 to via SMS, which is 2G, last I check, not 5G, uh, and, and the National Health Insurance card, which is an IC card that was issued dates back to 2003, right? So, but these were very familiar components. These were components already 
already well understood uh, by the cybersecurity white hat community as well as the privacy minded people. And the way they're put together are not designed by the government. As I mentioned, it's uh, demanded by the social sector, by the very people who are the most privacy aware uh, and, um, you know, uh, even demanding at times, uh, basically saying the government should abolish whatever centralized collection and must adopt the latest in privacy enhancing technology. I mentioned multi-party security, but they are also demanding federated learning, split learning or differential privacy, homomorphic encryption and so on, the latest in the privacy enhancing technology. So us in the government by simply adopting the demand of the social sector gained legitimacy not because we're particularly legitimate but because they are legitimate and we can't feed them we must join them it, it, it is a digital utopia i'm i'm sorry i gotta go pack i'm <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're welcome to taiwan we issue the gold cards you can get <laughs> residency uh immediately even before entering taiwan <laughs> As, uh, one new question just came through, which is, um, thank you for sharing, is digital democracy a unique implementation? Are there other locations that you're aware of that have had success with similar models? Mm -hmm. That's a great mm -hmm. question. Thank you. Yeah, we, we actually learn uh, most of the systems that uh, we uh, develop are not uh, actually initially started in Taiwan. Uh, and the moderator already mentioned that Polis started as a Seattle thing. Uh, and the um, distribution that I showed you uh, of the divisive and consensual statements, that particular screenshot was from Bowling Green, Kentucky. Uh, there's actually quite some success in applying Polis-like conversations in a smaller scale within one district or one municipality because people trust each other more and it's easier to have a physical town hall uh, in addition of this um, digital equivalent of the town hall. Uh, the petition platform that I alluded to uh, are a direct adaptation from Better Reykjavik uh, from Iceland. Iceland is also uh, very well developed uh, in their ideas of digital democracy. The participatory budgeting part came from uh, Decidima and Council from Barcelona and Madrid, um, respectively. Uh, I, I can go on, but but the point here is that it really is a a planetary community of digital democracy, and what we are doing essentially is just providing one of the the labs, if you will, uh, to try out the latest innovation. But we don't come up with all the innovations. The presidential hackathon was from the German prototype fund. The way we vote in presidential hackathon on the quadratic voting was from Ethereum. Okay, not really a country, but semi-sovereign uh, and so on. So so we, we get the, the best and better practice from all over the world. If I may, uh, we have the, the question from Chrysan. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the question here is, how does, um, how can digital democracy cope with the challenge uh, when a dictatorship uh, also uses digital solutions to control people. Yeah, well, first it's to make sure that uh, we control the terms uh, on our terms, democratic terms, right? Uh, we, we, for example, uh, the idea of transparency, all the civic tech uh, innovations uh, are based on the idea of the control yuan, jian cha yuan, with the people, not just for the people, right? Holding the government uh, and the businesses to account. So uh, this control is citizen control and transparency means making the state and the multinationals transparent to the citizens uh, as opposed to in a digital dictatorship. Transparency would mean uh, state control, right? Making the citizen transparent to the state. Uh, and I mentioned credit unions in Taiwan. If somebody has a lot of social credit, it means that uh, they enjoy a high degree of trust locally. They can lend a lot from their local co-ops and credit unions. Uh, but in digital dictatorship, somebody with a lot of social credit simply means they have a high score in their provincial database, right? So again, the same word means uh, radically different things. So I believe uh, the idea of digital democracy is to disassociate the terms that we usually associate with centralized control and uh, to move 
from thinking in purely the centralized control terms. When we think of AI, for example, I always say assistive intelligence instead of artificial or authoritarian intelligence. And in fact, that is also why I wrote my job description in the form of a prayer uh, to a kind of um, reimagine the possibility so that the centralized authoritarian community do not monopolize the use of the terms uh, promoted by Silicon Valley uh, and that we can think of it in a much more pro-social. It's very short, so I might as well recite it as my job description. It goes like this. When we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, well, let's always remember the plurality is here. So the Taiwan model, a part of a pluralistic democracy, inspired, I believe, the world that dictatorship, lockdown, top-down takedowns is not the only model to counter the pandemic and the infodemic. We can encourage plurality and democratic spirit while doing exceedingly well on countering both the pandemic and the infodemic. Well, thank you. That was kind of a tour de force ending. Um, I really appreciate that uh, that last that last bit there. I think it's a uh, it's very inspiring what you've provided for us today. It's really it's wonderful to hear these detailed answers and, and really appreciate you taking the time. Wei Ting, uh, did you did you have a, a any final comment? No, I think it's great. I'm amazed by all the answers you have. I, I have way more questions, but I think so far it's been really good. Thank you. Thank you for the conversation. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, Minister Tang. We know that you have a busy day ahead of you, mm -hmm. and we really appreciate you taking the time and agreeing for to this conversation. And we hope that we can uh, have one again soon, <laughs> and maybe we'll all meet in Taiwan soon. I hope so. Yeah, definitely. Uh, go get a go kart, and we can meet <laughs> in Taiwan. Uh, but uh, till we meet, uh, live long and prosper, everyone. Bye. Indeed. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and. Uh, Please be on the lookout for further activities under Asian Futures at Ohio State. Be well, everyone. Take care. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.